Hello Internet. You know I should say I'm excited and the new people laugh about it. Uh, while I'm here at the farm of a 3 2 battalion, Ricky Wing, they said to me I, I really have a tower look or something. I can't even say the word in English. So it's the Norse. But I want to say to you people, this is my friendly face. I'm really trying to smile here. But anyway, now that you're all laughing, you wouldn't believe we had some uh, wonderful people we met and we want to thank every one of them. Uh, today we're going to have to speak, we, we're speaking about Obskeptic. That is also known as Ox uh, Smoke Shell because of what happened at the Smoke Shell place. Uh, we have three guys here, two from 3-2 Battalion and one of our own, uh, Andrew Whitaker, who was at 6-1 Meg, and they're just discussing the, the operation in general terms. And I think it's fascinating to bring the different units together, and I think we should do more than that. So, don't talk to me anymore, I'm just sitting here. Over to them, we'll start with Peter Williams, he was a major in uh, uh, Free 2 Battalion, Ricky Wings, also one, one Ricky, one Special Forces Regiment, wonderful fellow, and that is now enough for me. Thank you. Good day, my name is Peter Williams, um, and we're going to talk about Operation Skeptic, which is also known as uh, Operation Smoke Shell. Um, Obskeptic started in the beginning of June 1980 and before that we were busy with an operation called Operation Ferreira and then we deployed into Skeptic and the interesting thing about Operation Skeptic is that it was a collaboration between 3-2 Battalion, the Parachute Battalion and 6-1 Me Mechanized Infantry and I believe it was the first time that rattles were used operationally across the border um, in the role that it was developed for. So the objective of Obskeptic was um, to attack the QRF, which was the headquarters of SWAPO, and they'd moved on to within 100 kilometers of the Southwest Africa um, Angolan border, and they'd set up very, very big uh, base camps in that area. And obviously to put pressure on SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, and to change the war from an infiltration coin type war to a revolutionary war within Southwest Africa itself. So I think the main objective was to um, destroy the three targets, of which one was smoke shell, and uh, deny the enemy the ability to be able to springboard from Angola into Southwest Africa. So during Obskeptic, I was in Delta 12 platoon and uh, Gavin uh, Marburg next to me was a platoon commander in that platoon as well and we were fortunate at this stage in 3-2 that there was a lot of um, white leader group. 3-2 battalion is a black infantry unit that is, comes from FNLA, the Front for the Liberalization of the Enclave of Angola and um, it had white leader groups so you would have an officer and an NCO and in our particular platoon, we had uh, an officer and an NCO, and the officer was Lieutenant Pierre van der Bolt, and the NCO was uh, Mario van Weyck, and he was also known as Mainer, because uh, he had been on the mines, and he'd worked on the mines before he joined the army. So, uh, I'll introduce you to Gavin now, and he was the platoon leader of Delta 12, and he was uh, with me during Obskeptic. Gavin. Thank you, Peter. My name is uh, Gavin Meinberg and uh, from, also from Delta 12, uh, as Peter has mentioned that the platoon commander was Peter and the, the NCO was uh, Mario is because we, uh, I was an anti-tank uh, officer or uh, uh, second lieutenant and Peter was also a uh, spare uh, as we, we could put more uh, uh, let's say white commanders or white leaders with the platoons. We'd like to also introduce you to okay. Andrew Whitaker and he was actually part of the 6-1 Meg guys that came in at that stage of the operation. Yes, I was in Alpha Company, platoon 2, going in to attack the base. Actually the base, the Swapo base was codenamed Smoke Shop. And so our attack on the base, although it was operation, part of Operation Skeptic, it very quickly became known as Operation Smoke Shop. It, it's named after that. Uh, the base that we attacked. Um, yeah, we, I suppose, being a rifleman, we sat in the back of a rifle most of the time. 
So didn't know too much of what was going on. Um, in fact, I only found out fairly recently about 3.2's involvement. Um, we were two rifle companies, uh, infantry, and then we had artillery and uh, panzer company. Uh, well, I think they called it uh, Echelon, is that right? That's yeah. correct. Echelon. Um, yeah, on the attack, which I, I suppose we'll talk about later, but uh, Bravo Company bore the brunt of the, and uh, so as part of the company, um, we were relatively unscathed when it came to casualties, etc. Um, yeah, no, I think we, we basically, I think we spent the night of the 9th at Malemba, which is where, where you guys were, were based, and then drove through the 10th and attacked at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon of the 10th. Yeah, I think, I think the attack on, on the Smokeshell base, where um, B Company, particularly Platoon 1, were hard hit. They had 12 deaths, 17 Kazovacs. Um, but, and, and from what I understand, it was the higher 13 of our guys were killed, but 12 from all those Platoon 1. And, and from what I understand, it was the highest number of South Africans killed in a single operation since the Second World War. Um, so it was quite significant in, in that sense. Um, but I think, yeah, um, you know, one of the casualties was Henny Ferreira, known as HP. Um, HP was declared dead on the site and they discovered that he was actually still alive. He was, I think, recorded as dead in, in terms of Commandant Dippenau's report. And they came back to him and said, you've got the numbers wrong because HP is still alive. Um, HP has had a, a legacy video done. Uh, we've raised funds. He's been, we've been trying to get him the best medical care. Uh, he still has a big hole in his back. He was, his rifle burnt out, it was shot, and he managed to get out. Uh, a few of the guys in the back died. He managed to get out, but in getting out, he was shot by a 14.5 mm anti-aircraft gun at, we, we believe at about between 10 and 15 meters range. So it was basically point blank range, range. Went through his stomach and out his back. Um, today, 40, nearly 43 years later, he still has a big hole in his back. His whole life, he's had around about 100 operations. He spent three years in, in one mill to start with. Um, so, I mean, he's the most remarkable guy. And, um, yeah, I think we'll do more legacy conversations about him in, in due course. So we just want to discuss the, the preamble, what happened before this particular operation. So 3-2 had two companies in the area. They had Golf Company and Delta Company. And um, an interesting fact is that just before um, OBS Skeptic was taking place, we had a very interesting operation called Operation Tiro Tiro that took place on the 21st of May, which is a whole story on its own. But just so that you know in context what's happening around us at that time of, of the whole war effort. And uh, we were busy initially uh, with an operation called Operation Ferreira that is named after Colonel Dion Ferreira, who was the officer commanding of 3-2 Battalion. And this is the area now south of Kumatu. And there was a lot of local population living in that area. And they would support the Swapo infiltrating into the area. And the Swapo would be able to sleep over in the kraals, collect water, be given food. And even if they were injured in, in southwest, they then were taken back to these kraals and assisted in, in various ways. So Operation Ferreira was uh, over a broad front and it was the first 10 kilometers within Angola and we had to uh, remove the local population in that area. And it wasn't an easy task and we basically swept from the, the western side to the eastern side um, and we informed the local population that they were being extricated from the area and if they didn't move we'd have to forcefully remove them. We did uh, burn their crops, we burned their houses, and we also um, informed them that the big baskets with all their saved food could be loaded on uh, donkey carts and, and horse-drawn sledges and so on. 
So I think when the process started, they realized that they were going to be moved forcefully if they didn't move on their own. And uh, they started moving out of the area. And uh, towards the end of that operation, um, they realized that the two or the three Swapa bases, with smoke shell being one of them, was um, unacceptable to the South African strategy of fighting the war, and that they were going to remove those bases. So we actually flew from, in, we were flown out of the bush back to Inana, and from Inana the guys climbed into a Flossie, a C-130 Hercules aircraft, and they were flying back to Ondangwa to get the briefing and work out exactly what the next strategy with the operation. Um, Golf Company had entered the aircraft and with their people, and then some of Delta went with, but I think I'll hand over the conversation to Gavin, because he was one of the members who flew in that aircraft that flew back and there was an incident that took place that um, had repercussions later and so I'll give over to Gavin and let him tell that part of the story. That is correct Peter, so it was myself and Pierre and we just had uh, uh, Delta, Delta 12 uh, with us from, from the, from the uh, Delta company and uh, on the flight uh, to Ndongwa we were flying obviously just tree top level and, um, and the next thing there was uh, this like ringing sound that was in the aircraft and it was obviously fire from, uh, from, from the ground level. It was, uh, we picked it up, it was obviously just uh, normal um, AK projectiles and the pier was standing in front of me, we, we obviously sitting in these, these hanging seats and our machines and most, all our kit was underneath us and this is obviously what saved us a lot. Uh, pier got uh, uh, shrapnel or, or one of the, the steel projectiles that come off the copper jacket when once the copper jacket has been removed and it uh, just passed his head we had a graze and I said to him yeah you was he bleeding and we didn't actually know and then uh, uh, also Peter just remind me as well of where uh, Pierre had his, uh, his Bible in his, in, his, uh, in, his, in his pocket and that also got hit so when we landed in Ndongwa obviously uh, the, the aircraft was it had to be uh, the normal security or the normal uh, safety factors of the of, of the airport had to take place, and but there was nothing wrong with the aircraft itself. We just had to obviously replace uh, when Peter was on his way via vehicle to us. Uh, we had to replace water bottles and things like that. Yeah. And myself and Pierre then obviously attended the, the order at the Oxford now. So um, we eventually regrouped back at Inana and we were going to start this operation called Operation Skeptic. 3-2 Battalion is an infantry unit and you have uh, three platoons with 10 people in and you have a headquarters of a platoon commander and a platoon sergeant. The platoon commander and the platoon sergeant are white um, infantry school uh, trained leader group element and their main job is to command and control the platoon and also be able to speak on the radio the uh, B-22 which is the HF set back to the tactical headquarters and then uh, obviously when you brought helicopters in the black Portuguese uh, conscripts are not as fluent in English as they are in Portuguese so it was easier to do the command and control with the Alouettes. So we were uplifted at Inana itself, we were driven closer to the border and we were dropped off. That was now Delta Company and Golf Company. And we were doing an area operation in southern Angola to clear the way of any swapper elements because the infantry fighting vehicles, which is the Rattle, is quite vulnerable uh, moving from um, their home base to the target area. So they want to move very fast and we weren't sure if the roads were mined and so on. So we started an infantry high-intensity operation and we had a company of the Parabats on our western side, we had Golf and Delta together and we slowly moved through the area and you basically get up early in the morning, uh, you do stand two in case, stand two is when you protect your position in case you were under attack, when there was no attack and then you'd lift these heavy uh, rag sacks that we called machilas and weighed about 40-45 kilograms and then you marched on. You'd form a tactical headquarters, a, a TV, a temporary base, and from there the platoons would go out in a fan type movement. So you would move in a northerly direction, you would turn east, and then you would come back in a southwesterly direction. 
which resembles um, the, a fan, uh, the, the fins of a fan. And then from there, that area would be cleared and you'd slowly move on. Unfortunately, the intelligence was very lacking and we assumed that there'd be water in the area. So I think after four or five days of uh, marching in, we realized that there's no water. So when we stopped in the day for the tactical, uh, the TB, the temporary base, we would send water patrols out. And uh, Mario van Weyck, the other NCO, did two of those patrols. I think I did three of those patrols on consecutive days. And obviously there was no water. And uh, the young lieutenant that we spoke about before that got injured in his head, that was Pierre van der Waal. He was a very, very religious guy and he always had his Bible on him. And uh, in the evenings we would have a little bit of Bible study and he would pray for us every day. And um, he said to me, no, Engelsman, um, let me have a turn at getting, uh, looking for water. And we said, there is no water in the area. And you're an officer, you shouldn't be doing water patrols. And he said, no, he's pulling rank on me and he's going to do the water patrol on this particular day. So um, we gave all our water bottles to this, um, I would say there was 20 of them in a, 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 a section and they went out to look for water and they were barely out about 10, 12 minutes on this water patrol and uh, he walked into a very well laid um, L-shaped ambush and he hit the L shape in the corner where the two uh, arms of the L meet and he had his platoon, a platoon sergeant from Delta 10 with him, we were Delta 12 and his name was Sergeant Brush and he was killed with a machine gun and uh, these guys were very very well organized and we do believe they possibly had Cubans with him and Pierre was shot in his right arm just above his elbow and the second shot went through his heart and he was instantly killed. He was a tall guy, light skinned, quite fair, and uh, he had uh, he didn't like the idea of putting black as beautiful all over his face. So it is possible that they saw him because of that. And he also had a A53 radio with a very very long antenna on it. So I think that he was easily distinguished uh, walking on patrol, and they obviously honed the sniper on him, and then they killed him. And obviously with the killing in this ambush there was a horrendous amount of fire taking place on the other members of the section, the water patrol itself. And uh, we were only about a kilometre and a half away and we could quite easily hear the noise and we immediately realised that we have to react and go and support them. Uh, we had a, a, company, a temporary company commander called uh, Jerry Green with us and the company commander that had just arrived in 3 to Battalion for Golf Company, who was the senior guy, was uh, a lieutenant, I think. He might have been a captain later, and his name was Jan Hochart. And uh, we, as 3-2, we didn't wait for any reason to deploy, and we immediately grabbed our kit and we started moving out. Gavin, the, as I was the spare platoon commander, he was the spare platoon commander and he obviously put up the HF radio so he could report to the tactical headquarters in Inana and inform them that there was a big attack taking place. And uh, I took um, Sergeant Mackay with me and uh, we just ran. We just took our webbing which is the light uh, pack that we wear with other big Bergens which had uh, normally a bottle of water in. Obviously this time we had no water and our ammunition and we just ran helter skelter through the bush. We tried to initially form into an extended line in case we bumped into the enemy, but I think the three two guys were so aggressive that we ended up in three single files running through the bush. Uh, when we arrived at the scene of the attack, there was still sporadic fire taking place um, on the battlefield itself. And uh, a group of uh, soldiers were standing around Pierre van der Waal and uh, Sergeant Brush that had been killed and obviously there was a lot of wounded people around and uh, Pierre was actually still in the um, the kneeling position and he always carried a R1 which is a longer rifle it's a 7.62 54mm caliber, caliber weapon and it's uh, a derivative of the Belgian FN and so when he got shot through the heart I think the, it was an instant kill shot he actually 
uh, fell forward and the barrel of the gun went into the sand. So we were still in that position. And uh, we were obviously told that he was dead and Sergeant Brush was dead. And uh, I think it's different. We had been in contacts before. We'd had a lot of action that particular year. And uh, we had seen people wounded. We've seen some of our own people being killed and so on. But I think it's different if you've been spent six whole months with uh, two white guys and you lived with them in the base in Buffalo. You were with them every single uh, uh, day. At night you slept two, three meters away from them in your bed. And uh, we'd spent that whole six months together every moment. No one was ever further apart than uh, um, that you could call them. And so I think that was initially a big shock. I was a permanent force member. And uh, that night especially, we had trials and tribulations about the incident and we discussed it with Gavin and with Mario. And I think the thing that hit us the most was that um, Pia was um, our moral compass, uh, spiritually. And it was very difficult to comprehend that this guy, who was a natural leader, he actually came from Wundberg. And his father had a very big engineering works called uh, um, Van der Welt Engineering. And that is actually how he got to Buffalo itself. His father won a contract to build the officer's mess or the, the troops mess, which is a big steel frame building with uh, clad with corrugated iron. And obviously when he went there, he liked the place and he obviously told his son, this will be the place for you to go to. Um, so I think it was a shock to our system. And I remember that night uh, under the stars, we obviously were digging in because we knew the enemy was prevalent all over, that uh, I lay next to Pia, I mean uh, next to Mario in the trench and we were lying uh, head to toe. So I was next to his toes and he was next to my toes and we were discussing the whole incident and uh, Pia said to me that uh, this whole, I mean Mario said to me, sorry, that this whole thing is now suddenly become alive and you realize that every day is precious and your time could, um, your time to be called up for higher service could take place at any time. And uh, Gavin as well was, um, he was very quiet and we realized that he was also trying to process the whole process. And then from there, obviously on the, on the battle scene itself, if we can go back to that, um, we had a lot of wounded guys and uh, Jerry Green, uh, Lieutenant Jerry Green told me I must go back, take one troop with me, go back to the temporary base and go and get medical supplies trip so that we could administer to the wounded, which I did do and I went back with a guy called Kamea and uh, on the way back we also hit a small little contact with some enemy that were also trying to evade us, we were trying to evade them. And I went back and uh, Lieutenant Jan Hofer asked me what's happening and I gave him a quick briefing but I was there for three, four minutes, picked up the medical bag and I ran back and we started administrating uh, first aid and obviously there were some guys with uh, gunshot wounds to the chest. We put an intercostal drain up, put drips up and I think uh, within an hour helicopters had arrived and taken them away and also thankfully they brought us a whole lot of water. And from there we carried on and uh, Ops uh, Skeptic being a much bigger operation than us just having a little contact, uh, we had to put this behind us and go on. So then the next two days um, were spent moving on to sweeping the area to Malemba itself. And I know we got to Malemba at about 12 o'clock in the day and the guys were quite jubilant to know that we'd arrived at the tactical headquarters. The tactical headquarters is an area where they have... Um, a uh, HAG, a helicopter admin area, and the helicopters would go there and from there they could bring more troops in to do stopper groups and obviously the echelon vehicles of 6-1 mechanized would be lagered there and that would be the support for the attack that took place and the helicopters, the Alouettes and the Pumas would be stationed there and uh, so it was a very important area and I think it marks the first stage in the operation where it goes from an area operation to dominate an area to actually starting the battle itself. Unfortunately, when we arrived there, uh, the enemy were also in that area. We went, obviously, the, 
tactical headquarters is built uh, or, or designed to be in an area where there were water holes and we were very close to the water holes and the enemy were obviously observing the water holes they must have seen us coming in and they realized we were a bigger force than that they were and that they were going to withdraw but before they withdrew a group of Swapo bumped into the parabats that were west of us and the, there was a very very big fire fire and that enemy ran in our direction and then bumped into us and then obviously the commander of that uh, area was actually a, a Swapo commander called Hulanganga and he informed his uh, what they call artillery and we call mortars to fire mortars in our direction uh, the mortars were quite close to us I think they were within a kilometer and a half and you could actually hear the mortar bomb being placed down the prop and then you heard that boom noise when the mortar actually uh, uh, leaves the, the pop and uh, we used to have guys with us that would start counting 1001, 1002 and that was to determine uh, how long the bomb would be in the air and from that you could determine where exactly the enemy was and we could then counter attack with our own mortars. But uh, the mortars landed very far behind us initially but I do believe they were well organized and they had an observer on the ground that was bringing the fire close to us and uh, we were two companies so we were 200 people and uh, we were spread over a large area we were still in extended line and the bombs came closer and closer until we actually heard the bombs landing and then you hear that uh, detonation and that zing of all the shrapnel flying over you and at that stage I started digging with my hands to dig myself into the ground a little bit. Um, on my right hand flank was, um, on my left hand, we were between Gulf and Delta. So I was at the edge of Delta Company and joining on to Gulf. And we had a Corporal de Toy to my left hand side and we had a Lieutenant Groenies Groenewald to my left. And I was the last man in the line and then to my right was Mario van Wyk and then all our troops and Gavin was obviously further down the line and um, it was soft sand with canopy trees so the bombs would actually fall through the canopy trees you could hear them breaking the branches then they would go into the soft sand of the, the ground itself and then it would detonate and because of the soft sand uh, a lot of the shrapnel was absorbed by the soft sand itself but uh, Tragically, one mortar bomb landed about a meter and a half behind Mario's right hand foot and he was lying prone on the ground looking through the sights of his AK-47 looking for enemy because we didn't just shoot at nothing we waited until we observed a target and then we'd bring fire in and normally then you would uh, bring fire in and your troops with you would see where you were firing and they would then concentrate that fire so this mortar bomb went off behind him and uh, all the shrapnel except one piece went into the back of his 3-2 boot. So his 3-2 boot was actually, it was uh, pulp. But unfortunately one very big piece of shrapnel flew over the top, um, of, over the top of his leg, over his buttocks, over his shoulder and bedded in the back of his skull and he was killed instantly. We obviously... Uh, ran over immediately and I remember someone still saying that we must stay down because there's still mortars in the air but at that moment in the frenzy of things you, you just run to your mate and check you know if he's alive and so on and uh, uh, the saving grace of that incident was that that big piece of um, shrapnel went into the back of his skull and I think he was dead instantly because when we got to him he basically had blood coming out of his nose and his mouth and there was no reaction or anything like that. Obviously once again very much like Pierce's incident uh, the aggression took over and we told the troops to stand up and advance and we advanced on the enemy and we just started shooting at random and I think that helped them also cease their mortar attack thinking that we were going to get too close to them. And um, I think let me just take a short breather and let Gavin tell his story about uh, the two incidences and what he heard. So let him uh, start off with Pierre's incident. Yeah, the reason for uh, let's say a reserve officer in a, in a platoon, like myself and Pierre, that were uh, COs at that time, uh, 
we actually had to receive, I don't know, I can't remember if we had received our rank or not, but it's not a trans flash. Um, and because I was anti-tank, and Pierre was obviously uh, uh, trained as uh, full on infantry, so that's why Pierre had the, uh, had the platoon commander status to him. And then I'm, I'm not sure, uh, Pete, did you have a, were you just also straight infantry or were you also? I was straight infantry straight at the time. time. And I think also because that year when we obviously finished our selection and all that we had to do to be part of a 3-2 battalion, uh, it was a very strong, strong intake from, from infantry school and the guys were really prepared to put their, their minds to, to fight for 3-2. For and, and there weren't many guys sent as RTU back of the selection. Uh, just to rewind as well to the, the incident of Pierre, myself and Pierre, obviously we spent a lot of time, we actually, uh, like brothers, he, he was, I was. And I was, I'm, I'm learning from him and he's obviously learning from our different tactics from navigational skills to, uh, to just normal platoon uh, commanding skills. And I can remember we had just finished our, our, our food for that morning. It, it was, it happened early, not early in the morning, let's say from about 1,000 hours. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 1,000 hours, yeah. And we just finished our food and obviously because we didn't have water and Obviously, on our, our small radios, we were talking to, to Peter and to Mario, and I also said to Peter, let me go, because I, as Peter's mentioned, I've been out two or three times already to go look for water, and I said, I'll, I'll go, and Peter said, no, no, he wants to go, and yeah, that's uh, how life goes, how it is. And, um, yeah, and, and obviously as soon as we heard the, the, the first shots go off in that ambush or that, that contact, uh, I had to get my radio up as Peter mentioned and then was to make comms and to get everything sorted uh, in our little TV now. And then to, as Peter mentioned, two days later when we got to the main uh, fighting force area, uh, that's when Mario was uh, uh, killed with the mortar. And because the, uh, we were working in such a, let's say, big groups, that was the two companies, that uh, the guys were spread out far and wide. And, uh, and I can also remember as soon as those mortars and things came in, obviously the radios went up again. Our, our fish line, we, we, I, I don't know why I, I call it fish line, that we had to throw up a reel that we threw up into the trees to make. Uh, connected to the B-52s and, uh, and make, uh, make comms. And um, as Peter mentioned, the mortars were f f first much further than it was. And because Mario and, and, and Peter were further down the line, uh, it didn't seem that close to me. And after we, the whole contact happened, uh, I, uh, Peter informed me that Mario was, uh, was killed as well. And there was there was a number of troops um, yeah. um, wounded on both uh, okay. attacks. So yeah. when uh, Pia was uh, killed, I think there were six or eight troops from our platoon that were then Kasevac. That's correct. And That's then true. when Mario was Kasevac, there were some of them, when Mario was killed, there were some of them that had also picked up shrapnel wounds and they'd also been evacuated by Puma. So from there, um, what happened was that we had secured the tactical headquarters and this equipment would be coming in and uh, Jerry Green and Jan Hofart approached me and they asked me if I'm okay and are we given an hour, are we okay to continue? And an interesting thing about 3-2 Battalion, when you arrive at the headquarters in Rundu, um, they call all of you together and they make it quite clear to you that uh, they honoured to have had you volunteer to come to 3-2, but at any stage in your career at 3-2, if you wanted to um, pack it up and you'd had enough, you were entitled to just raise your hand and say, I've had enough, and no one would hold it against you, and you were actually fortunate because you were asked where you want to go to. Now, in South Africa, uh, in the military, you never had any choices, so if you were sent somewhere, you just went. So this was uh, an interesting aspect. 
because we were told if you want to go to Natal Kalan in Durban or you want to go to the castle in Cape Town, they would ensure that you would go there. But obviously the pressure is on these young leader group guys and uh, I think uh, if one guy had said he wanted to go to the castle, there would have been a whole stream of them going. But obviously no one ever um, executed on that privilege that we had. But obviously Jan O'Hart and Jerry Green asked me uh, without saying it, you know, am I okay or do I want to clock out? And I said, no, I'm fine. I'm, I'm quite fine. So they said it's important for us to carry on now and stick together. So they tasked Gavin and myself with 12 troops to march back the 66 kilometers back to the border. And we were told that we were going to be meeting a, a mechanized infantry force, which was the Rattles. And at that stage, we didn't know what 6-1 mechanized battalion was. And I still asked um, Jan Hoogaard, what is a Rattle? Because I uh, hadn't even heard of one or ever seen one. And he basically said to me, it's almost like three buffles welded together and they've got a big uh, anti-tank weapon on the top. But he said, when you see it, you will know exactly what it is. And uh, they gave us two engineer guys that came with these um, broomstick things that were, they cleared mines with them. And it was a two-track road that was running straight back from Alema to the border, and this road had to be swept off mines. And uh, we obviously packed some uh, food and we took a lot of water and off we went down this road. And uh, it was quite eventful because at that stage Swapo in the area had dispersed all over. They didn't want to stick together in big groups because they realized the enemy was amongst them. So I think uh, we went back, I think it took us two days and we had a few contacts along the way down. And it was uh, reassuring to know that uh, as soon as we hit contact, within three to five minutes, there was Alouette helicopters in the air that would come in and assist us. And uh, we would do a, um, a sweep line and attack, but the enemy obviously were just harassing us and they would disappear. I know on one occasion we shot two bodies and they sent a puma in to pick up the bodies of the swapper that we shot. And they obviously sent us some... Uh, water and they sent us some extra ammunition and then the night before um, so that evening later we were supposed to meet the rattles and the tech hq was forever asking us when we made communication how far are you you must go faster we're in a hurry you're holding up the whole operation and um, we had a, a quite a severe attack just before the border with uh, some robust enemy and at that stage, uh, I'll give it over to Gavin and he will tell you about his malaria that he, he had contracted before, but then he was more prevalent. Yeah, to, obviously, on the, way, on the way back, as Peter mentioned, we, we hit a couple of contacts. I can remember the one specific contact where, my, um, where my, my radio man, he got shot through the arm and he did not want to be Kazadak. I don't know if Peter can recall that. And uh, that's how we went back. And then uh, getting back, the, the type of terrain is uh, uh, the Mapani bush. Uh, that's how we knew it, is the Mapani bush and thick sand. Um, and then just to come back to you, Lisa, that's why we wore flat sole uh, boots, obviously not to leave many tracks, and obviously to, to increase your footprint onto the sand, which you could then uh, not sink down into the sand with, your, with the heavy load of your of the kit that we carried. And then obviously when we got back to base, I, I, was, I was feeling extremely uh, uh, sick and then obviously the, the, the doctors uh, diagnosed it as uh, malaria. I was obviously straight into the sick bay and then obviously I didn't see Peter until I returned back to Buffalo uh, when you guys were finished with, with the main ops. Now. So what had happened um, before we actually got to the border was that we were involved in a contact and uh, two of our guys were Kasevac and uh, uh, Gavin then obviously climbed on the helicopter and he was taken back to the tactical headquarters, but the rear tactical headquarters, so he flew into Enola. Then um, it was starting to get dark and we stopped at an enemy base, a disbanded enemy base next to the road. And if you can imagine us um, walking south, we would turn in on the road that came from the base 
we swept the trenches and we slept in the trenches. The next morning, just before first light, we then uh, disembarked out of the, the camp itself or the trenches and we went back to the road. But there's about a six meter uh, gap between the road that comes in from the north and the one from the south. And in our haste, we didn't sweep that little piece of road. Then we continued down and it was in the early morning that we got to these rattles. And I must say they were impressive vehicles. They six wheel armored vehicles, um, whereas we used to a buffalo that fits 10 troops at the back with a driver in the front. I think they had 10 troops in the back of this huge, huge vehicle. And I uh, obviously asked them, you know, take me to your commander. And he was a commandant Dippenar. And he actually invited me inside his rattle. And I think it even had air conditioning and lots of space. And it had maps all over. And he said to me, Woodman, where are we? So I had to orientate myself because they used different maps to us. We were using one to a hundred thousand maps. And I think they were using one to 50,000. But we orientated ourselves and I told him exactly where we were. He asked me about the enemy and what the threats were and so on. But I think yeah, he took a disliking to me, not only because I was Afrikaans, but we'd been in the bush for 10 days or so. And I think he uh, took exception to the smell, that, uh, the odor that was coming from me. And then he said to me he would rather that I drive in the vehicle behind him. And then I could speak on the radio to him, and uh, then I could help them with the navigation. And I said, the navigation is actually quite easy. It's a, a two-track road, and you just follow the road. And then when I got into this vehicle, I looked at these young national servicemen, and I thought to myself, these guys are actually too young to be in the army. I think they took them out of the hostel in Standard 6, because none of them had any beards or anything like that. I know that the rattle I was in, there was two guys that still had like squeaky voices. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, the, the army is scraping from the bottom of the barrel with these young kids. But I must say, they knew their drills very well. They worked as a team. And uh, the, the commander was a corporal. And he told me where to sit next to the gunner. And he gave me a headset on my, on my head with a helmet and everything. But uh, being an infantry guy and knowing the simple life and you have one radio and you speak to one person, it was rather confusing because you had this box and you had to speak to people and the one guy speaks to you in the left ear while there's another guy talking to your right ear. When the commander speaks, he's speaking into both ears. So on a few occasions, the, uh, the gunner had to help me and just say, look, you're speaking to the wrong net now. You, you want to speak to the commander. And anyway, um, I thought to myself, this is maybe the way to go. Because we had gone in as two companies, 200 guys. We thought we could uh, sort out Swapo. In fact, we thought we could go to Cairo and sort out the whole of Africa. And these guys had given us uh, a harding 10 to 1. We'd lost some very dear comrades of ours. And uh, I was thinking, me as a permanent force guy, of, you know, there must be other options in one's career. And uh, this rattle thing looked like a, a very, very nice option. And uh, the only problem with it is it's a little bit like a, uh, um, I think like a tin of fish, and you're just a fish in the tin. Because you can't see much out, the portals are very small and so on. The driver sits in the middle in the front, and he just drives that thing down the road. And I'm not sure, I think it's got a 12-cylinder engine in, and it actually doesn't sound like a vehicle. It sounds more like an aeroplane because when it starts up, it goes and then it's got a manual and automatic gearbox and uh, everything passes very fast. We, our top speed was four kilometers an hour walking on the ground. I think these guys were going 40, 50 kilometers an hour and they would just ride over trees. If there was a slight bend in that road, they would, couldn't make the bend. They'd just carry on, knock a tree on and they would carry on. So this was looking very uh, uh, a good prospect for me in my future endeavors in the military. But uh, that was uh, stopped very quickly when we hit a landmine. And fortunately, it wasn't common on Dippenau's vehicle or mine. It was the one behind us. And uh, funny enough, so we all went over that mine, and only the third vehicle hit the mine. And it wasn't the front wheel. It was the middle wheel on the right-hand side. And uh, all aspirations of becoming a mechanized 
uh, uh, member is went out the window immediately because I thought, no, these things are big targets and they're going to attract trouble. But to my amazement, I thought, well, that will be the end of the whole operation. And I think within 10 minutes, that vehicle had been fixed. They actually took a chain, and they chained that whole axle up in the air, and they just carried on going with the other five wheels. So that was very interesting. And uh, in no time at all, I mean, we'd spent two days, or I think three nights and two days to do the 66 kilometers. I think we were there in an hour and a half, even with the mine that had gone off. And uh, obviously we got out at the TAC HQ, and then these uh, young fellows went on to fight the real war. Just want to add that there were some things that uh, were a little bit different in that the tactical headquarters was there as a helicopter admin area, and normally at the helicopter admin area you would have uh, after and uh, fuel for the aeroplanes, the pumas and the alouettes. And unfortunately, due to bad planning, the um, the rattles moving so fast and uh, some logistic problem that these aircraft fuel never arrived at the tactical headquarters. And we were meant to be taken in a stopper group. So when the, the rattles would attack these bases, we'd be airlifted by helicopter north of that area and form stopper groups and then we would cut the enemy off and uh, uh, try and destroy them before they could escape. And then normally 3-2 was used to mop up the bases and attack what remains of the remnants inside the bases. But that part of the operation didn't take place because they didn't have fuel at that stage. Then if I can just go forward a whole lot, because that was now on the 9th of June 1980, and um, these young boys or soldiers went off into the war itself. And that very same night that uh, they left the tactical HQ, the tactical HQ was attacked by Swapo. And fortunately, um, I was in a trench that was meant for a mortar pit, and it was very deep. It was about six foot deep. So that when the 81 mm mortar was inside, you couldn't see the muzzle flash and so on. But uh, fortunately for this hole that we had dug, there wasn't sufficient mortars. So I lay in the bottom of that, and we were attacked quite severely by infantry of Swapo, but they did what's called a, a standoff bombardment and they shot uh, weapons over us. So I lay in that big trench with three or four of my troops and we were counting the red traces and the green traces and I think the guy with the green traces eventually won with how many traces went over us. Um, and then just to finish off my part of Obskeptic is um, I saw these uh, young boys come back two days later after the attack and everything and uh, I actually spoke to some of them and I said to them are you guys the same guys that went in because I saw these young boys going in and the guys that came out looked like older men the eyes were you could see they'd been through war and they'd see things that uh, a 20 year old or 19 year old shouldn't uh, have to see and after that uh, when the rattles withdrew, Delta Company stood in an area operation and we did some mopping up and there was a few contacts and so on. Okay, just, just to explain mechanized infantry, we used rattles, which was an infantry carrier. It had a 20 mm uh, cannon and a Browning machine gun. Um, and so it consisted of 11 people or 11 soldiers. There was the driver, the gunner, the section leader or the platoon commander, um, the tail gunner, and six troops, I think. So. And, yeah. um, the intention was always that it wasn't a tank. A lot of people looked at it and said, oh, there's a tank, you just drove through the... And, and the vehicle did have portholes that you could fire out of and things like that. But I think that was basically more in case you got into a, a conflict where you hadn't, hadn't got out the vehicle. The, the, the idea was always, as you hit contact, the doors opened, the troops disembarked and did the attack on foot with covering fire from your, your 20 mil and your browning. Um, it was never intended to be anything other than a, 
um, a troop carrier to a large extent the Biffle predeceased it, uh, pre preceded it. Um, the Biffle was open top. Um, there was no covering fire, so it really just just took the troops to to a site and then everything was done on foot. Um, yeah, so that was the rifle. Uh, we were also the first guys to use a, a rifle 90 mm. So the, the turret of the rifle was designed that it could fit different size cannons. And the, the noddy car or the airlines had been found wanting in the bush. It, it was small, the tracks weren't wide enough, it was slow, it, it couldn't bundu bash. So they actually put 90 more cannons, the exact same cannon as a, an airlines. Uh, onto a rifle, and we had a couple of 90 more rifles, I can't remember how many were, it was four or six, on the operation with us. Obviously those didn't carry troops, they had a driver and a gunner and a, a section leader, um, but their role was very different. Okay, one of the one of the things cropped up, uh, I just spoke about H.P. Ferreira a few minutes ago, and Colonel Dion Ferreira has now been mentioned. To the best of my knowledge, although they shared a surname, they were not related in any way. Um, but then, yeah, from our side, being uh, mechanised infantry, um, I think one needs to understand that the smoke shell base was quite a large base. I think it was something like 40 to 50 square kilometres. So, so within our two infantry companies, each platoon was allocated a certain, a certain sector. Um, Paul Lowe was uh, B Company Platoon 1. Uh, they hit the, the biggest uh, problem in terms of uh, anti-aircraft, both 23mm and 14.5mm cannons being uh, used in a ground roll. It, it would appear and, uh, that these, these weapons had only just arrived at the base. So the, the intel that we were acting on was not aware of those guns. So we, we at no stage knew what to expect in that. In that sort of, we, we sort of expected a bit of small arms fire, maybe the RPG. But um, it was a totally unexpected turn to be uh, faced with uh, 23 mil and 14.5 mil. And, and they, to a large extent, wrecked ha havoc on, uh, on B Company Platoon 1. Um, 2 one itself was shot out and, and actually burnt out on the on this, uh, the scene. Um, then of the other three rifles, two of them were shot out and only one of the four rifles in that uh, platoon was not shot out. Um, obviously 12 uh, casualties, 17 casualties. Um Yeah, and... Uh, you know, I know Paul Lowe takes a lot of pressure, asked himself continuously whether he could have done things differently. But, but I, I think it's a good time to say that the company commander's orders were disobeyed by Paul, and he was actually threatened on the site with the court martial for disobeying those orders. Uh, if he hadn't disobeyed those orders, I think of the 44 guys in that platoon, potentially all 44 would have been killed. As it turned out, 12 killed, 17 Kazakh, and, and I, I think I've mentioned it before, um, we don't re really give credit to the guys working behind the scenes. To, to get 17 Kazakhs and all 17, and some were serious, seriously injured, um, and all 17 survived. Um, HP obviously being the most notable, but the guys like Mario Kuforio, who lost an eye, uh, there's a guy, George Contarato in Port Elizabeth, who I think wears a bag as well. Uh, a lot of guys were seriously injured, and, and I think it's, it's only thanks to the medics, the chopper pilots, the doctors that, um, that attended to these, these guys that every one of them survived. Um, an interesting conversation I had with Andrew Lobsher a while back. Uh, Andrew Lobsher is one of the doctors that was on the operation of us. And talking about H.P. Ferreira, Andrew's attitude is that the only reason H.P. survived 
was because of how well organized Commandant Dippenau was. He said it was just like clockwork. Everything just worked. It was, they got him to where the choppers could land, they got him to Oshakati or in Dunworth, Protontain, one mill, and, but, but it was just like a well oiled machine that did that. Yeah. Getting to my personal experience in, in uh, the attack on Smoke Shell, I was in A Company, uh, Rifle 1 2, um, and as we had contact, our rifle hit a tree stump and broke its wishbone. So while everyone else was fighting, we were listening to it, we were watching the choppers overhead, we, were, we knew there was trouble, but we couldn't do much about it. Uh, we were stranded there for 28 hours. So once the battle finished and everyone else moved off, we were still on the door of um, We were shot at quite regularly through the day, but did not return fire because of, obviously we didn't want to give our exact position away. Uh, you know, there were 11 of us, uh, it, uh, it was quite hairy. Um, and yeah, early hours of the next morning we did a, a little patrol. During the night we actually heard chains and, and things. And when we did the patrol we realised we were within two to three hundred metres of where these guys were. So, so we, were relative, we were really close. But yeah, I mean, um, I think Operation Skeptic itself continued for another nearly three weeks. Um, the United Nations gave us an order to be out by the 30th of June. So I think typical arrogant SADF, we left in the early hours of the 1st of July. <laughs> Just to say it up yours. <laughs> but yeah, we had a few small little contacts, but nothing, nothing major for the next two, three weeks. Yeah, I, I think, uh, of course, the benefit of these group interviews is that you things come back to you when someone says something. And, and Peter, you're talking about the guys in 3-2 having, always having the option to leave. Um, brought back a, a very distinct memory that I've it's been laying dormant for 43 years. But just taking it back to probably about the 4th or 5th of June, at Amatea Base. Um, now the norm at Amatea Base is you had a squadron or echelon of panzer guys and you had one infantry, mechanized infantry company. And suddenly it was a hive of activity. We had both infantry companies there, there were parabat companies arriving and we all knew that something was going to go down. Uh, suddenly we were doing a lot more training, uh, a lot more I suppose rehearsal, rehearsals, um, and then probably on around about the 6th of June, I'm again guessing in terms of times, we were all called onto the parade ground and we were told, guys this is it, um, we are going to be attacking this base in southern Angola, um, but you guys have the option, if you don't want to go, Now's the time to pull out. And, and that's where Peter just... Um, and to the best of my knowledge, not a single guy actually took that option. Which, maybe, maybe if one guy had gone, a whole host of others would have followed, I, I don't know. But, but I'm not aware of anyone having taken that option. We then had photos of each company taken, and a day or so later we left, we... I think spent a night in Nana or outside in Nana and then to Manemba and so it went. Um, yeah, then after the attack, uh, as I, I had briefly uh, said, um, we did a bit of driving around. The, the original planning was, and I'm, I can't remember the name of the town, but there was a town with an, air, with an airport or an air base. And the initial, the initial instructions we had. We were going to take out the social base and I think we were then going to turn east and go and take out this airfield. But with with the unexpected resistance at Smoke Shop, uh, it was discovered that this airbase had built in tanks around the airbase. So the decision was not to go in that direction. We so so the rest of of Operation Skeptic was relatively unplanned in the sense that the plan was smoke shell, then this airbase, 
and then home. Instead, we did quite a lot of riding around southern Angola, uh, spent time in, uh, I think the town is Mambua, and also another place called Matu. Um, set up a, an ambush outside Mambua of enormous proportions. They mined the tar road flat out, and we were behind an embankment, and then they discovered our own forces were coming through the road. So that had to be stopped. But yeah, you know, we had one or two small contacts, but nothing really, and, and, and nothing major. And, and as I say, um, first of July, early hours, we we went home or went back to Namibia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, look, I think I think the Tiffies are amazing. And for those that don't know, Tiffies were basically the mechanics. Um, the, I think the big problem was because of this whole battleground and potentially, um, what's his name, the general, oh, Constant Fulgun, he arrived on the scene, he got flown in and uh, got on a rot- rattle and two minutes later the rattle hit a landmine and uh, he jumped on the chopper and flew home again. But I think the, the concern was that they couldn't just come and get us out. Um, once they were able to come with the, the necessary tow, tow rattle, I think they towed us out with another rattle. Um, we, we got, we got a new rattle. Don't ask me where they were, but, but the, what they did is they, they reassigned things like medical rattles, um, to, to troops, uh, where the rattle broke in down. Um, so we then had a new rattle. Our old rattle was, uh, um, repaired. Um, and, and I'm just going on, uh, Peter was talking about the speed. I did a video with Young Milan, and I think he said it took the Tiffies, or the troops, even if they made it, something like seven minutes to change a wheel of that rattle. I mean, that is like amazing. When you look at the size of that thing, the, the spare was on top of the, the roof here to get that down. Um, so, so the guys were well oiled, and, and again, I mentioned the chopper pilots and the medics and things. The Tuffies also did a, a wonderful job in the background and, and probably didn't really get the recognition for it. Um, but yes, then we, as I said, drove around looking for... We were mortared one night in particular. I think it was... Um, I think, in fact, we'd, uh, there was a British Lions uh, rugby uh, test on, and that afternoon, old Andrew Merrington, our signaler, had managed to tune our, our radio into the rugby, and we'd listened to the rugby test. And that night, uh, and I think by then we got a bit arrogant and a bit, uh, we, were, we were having a bit of a bra there, we had shot a few cat- cows, and we were having a bit of a bra, and the next thing the mortars came flying. Um, but but really we had very little incident uh, after the, the actual attack on, on Smokeshaw. So just to be able to respond to, to Andrew's stories, the camp that he was talking about was a camp called Onjiva and it had uh, tanks in the hold down position and I think that uh, the generals decided that uh, we couldn't go out with blood on our hands and not go out with a win and so on. But I think that uh, we realised that this base was a large, a lot, lot larger and bigger than what uh, the intelligence had indicated to us. So although we captured a lot of equipment and destroyed the infrastructure, I think this was just the build up to the following year of Ops Protea and the actual attack of Onjiva and Jungongo, which were the two main uh, FAPLA bases and the Swapo headquarters at that stage. Because the enemy basically moved from the bush and joined up with FAPLA, which is the forces of the Angolan army. And so I think this was a, a, a deciding uh, phase within the war itself. That, uh, and obviously the rattles were, bat- were blooded in battle and they had done extremely, extremely well. Another point of uh, a footnote towards the end is just that uh, the South African soldiers... Um, had this thing about Space Ops Machni Seni, which is special operations, you're not allowed to talk about it, and you also on the State Secrecy Act. And um, I think for many, many years all these stories lay dormant. 
and I think with Legacy's involvement and uh, telling the stories of those guys, and I know I think there's two or three other uh, videos about this attack uh, on Alpha Company and uh, the personal stories of those guys, and I think Harpia uh, Ferreira's story as well, that it's got the um, different veterans groups, and I include the Barabats, 101 Battalion, 3261 Megagnaz, and even the police uh, Operation K guys together more often, and we're able to discuss these operations. And I think that this also gives credit to 3-2 Battalion, because Opsmoke Shell is known as the operation where 6-1 Meg was um, blooded in battle, and uh, I think sometimes that we forget that the Parabats were there, and that 3-2 was there, because these guys were actually in the forefront. An interesting thing as well is that this has brought guys from various walks of life and uh, Andrew hasn't told you but he's a chartered accountant from a, three generations of chartered accountants, four generations sorry, of accountants that works out of East London and um, so he has also uh, embedded himself within Legacy and he's giving um, interviews and so on with Legacy and at the moment we are actually in the Northern Cape in a small town called Groblas Whip. And this is actually a get-together of 3-2 Battalions Reconnaissance Wing, a very, very small group of people. And we've invited him and Chris along to come and do the videos for us. But I think the future will be getting all the different veteran groups together and to tell our stories.